Welcome to the Keen Yoga Podcast, it's an host, Adam Keen. This podcast was started with the aim of presenting different views on yoga and the yoga lifestyle, originating from my 20 years of practicing and teaching Ashtanga Yoga. I hope you enjoy the interviews and find they inspire and inform your own journey with yoga. If this is the case, you're welcome to leave a donation on our podcast page. We endeavour to produce one interview a week and are always looking for new guests, so if you have any ideas, please feel free to get in touch. Or equally, if you want to give any other feedback, we'd love to hear from you. Also, don't forget, if you're listening to the podcast on iTunes, to leave a review. Today's guest on the Kino Yoga podcast is Simon Borg Olivier. Simon has been studying yoga, movement and breathing for over 50 years, and it's his second time on the Kino Yoga podcast. He's a teacher's teacher, having taught many of the eminent teachers we now know today, and is credited with having a huge influence on the Australian yoga scene. Not predominantly Ashtanga, Simon has studied with Patabi Joyce, as well as many other teachers and masters from around the world. He is also a science-based academic, lecturing on physiotherapy in numerous faculties in Australia. Simon was an earlier guest, as I mentioned, so check out the episode, it's probably one between one and ten, the very early ones. And it was during this episode that what I particularly was struck by was a uniquely valuable insight in his teaching within the breathwork aspect. So since this time, I wanted to get him back to talk more exclusively on the relationship of breath to movement and energy in the body, as well as in more in practical terms as to how to start and maintain a breath-based practice. It's my pleasure to share this episode with you. And Simon, now in his 60s, is a testament in his vitality and youth to living a life in breath. So I hope to follow his example. And I love speaking to Simon. Um, I'm really pleased to have you on the show, Simon. So welcome, Simon, to the second time uh, with us on the Kia Yoga podcast. Great to have it's you again. Pleasure to be here with you again, Adam. Thank you very much for inviting me. Really nice to be here. And specifically today, we're going to talk about um, Simon's well, like I said, his expertise on breathing. But um, first of all, so I'm, um, just give us a little bit. I mean, you are really a, one of the yoga pioneers in Australia altogether. So many of the well-known teachers have cited you as their, uh, you know, an early inspiration for them. So do you want to give a little bit of your background about how you came to yoga? And, uh, oh, well, I guess my introduction to it in... I was going to say how you came over on the ship, first of all. On the ship. Oh, go. yes. Yeah. I came on a boat from Southampton to... Um, to Australia in 1968. But just before that, when I was about six years old, my father, who was a free diver in, in the Mediterranean, I was born in Malta. So my father was a free diver and he taught me how to hold my breath because he realized my bones were heavy and I couldn't swim underwater. I couldn't swim on top. So he taught me how to swim under the water. And uh, you know, I, I could swim a lap of an Olympic pool underwater before I could swim on top. And so that was my introduction to breathing. And then I had a it, well, on the boat from England to Australia, I had uh, an Olympic athlete, Basil Brown, who taught me yoga techniques such as Uddiyana, Nauli, Lauliki. And this was really wonderful. And it was only possible for me to do because of the introduction to breath retentions by my father. And so that, that goes back, you know, more than 50 years now. And I've been really enjoying my relationship with breathing ever since. How did that, um, that athlete, Basil, Basil Brown, um, how did he know about, about the techniques? Did he? He was from Rhodesia, and I suspect, I mean, he's, he passed away in 1973, sadly. But I, I understood from his family that he was probably taught by some of the Indians who had come there or by the Kalahari Bushmen that were there or the different type of, of, of uh, tribes people because they have tremendous very powerful breathing techniques in uh, South Africa, in the tribes people there. And as they do all over the world, every indigenous culture has got its own breath control techniques. But somehow along the line, he taught me these things. He, he picked them up and I don't know exactly. I've talked to his family many times, but it's a mystery. So before we get into the breathing, and, and that's interesting that yeah, every culture, every primal culture does have something with the breath, don't they? Um, 
just talk a bit about your yoga background. I, I, just to refresh my memory, if nothing else, actually. Um, because every time we do a podcast with someone in Australia, they always mention you as one of their teachers. So I just... Um, oh, that's nice. Just, yeah, yeah, often, uh, so often. So, yeah, just um, refresh my memory as to how you how you got into yoga and, and your your primary influences as a, as a as a student. Right. Well, I had a Tibetan Lama in Australia when I was seventeen years old. His name was Tafi, but he's disappeared off the face of the world. I can't find him again. For, you know, for the last forty years, in the um, in the early nineteen eighties, I um, I did a. a teacher training course with uh, a group which were teaching what they called Oki Yoga, as in Masahiro Oki Sensei. And that was influenced by Japanese martial arts and games and, and things like this, but also by the teachings of BKS Iyengar. So in that course, I had a couple of great Iyengar teachers. And the one that I spent a lot of time with uh, was, was Shandor Remite. I, I have a lot of respect. and I Did you? We had him on the podcast. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I did actually see you did that, and he spoke so nicely on your podcast. Yeah. He's a very amazing guy. Profound. Um, yeah. <laughs> right. So, Shandor in Australia. Yeah, yeah. Yes, he's 12 years my senior. And, you know, although I started learning from him in the mid or early 1980s, I know he's always going to be at least 12 years ahead of me in his understanding, you know. He's uh, a remarkable human being who kept on studying the whole time, and he's still out there, out there at it, you know. So he's amazing. And he was the one who suggested I go to India to study with uh, BKS Iyengar. And then he also introduced me to people who I learned Ashtanga Vinyasa Yoga with. And um, you know, I went to eventually to meet um, Patabi Joyce. And I also met Jessica Chow and learned with him a little bit as well. In Australia, before I left, I had a great teacher who taught me a lot of breath control. And his name was Professor Bimdev. And Professor Bimdev did remarkable things with his breath control. And if you look him up online, there's one video which his son and daughter put up online where you see him using incredible breath pressure tre techniques, which I can talk about perhaps, where he's able to bend iron bars by breathing into his eyeball. And incredible guy, <laughs> really phenomenal. You know? And my Chinese teachers had remarkable similar ab abilities as well. So, Have you managed to do that yet? I can breathe. I can feel pressure coming into my eyeball when I breathe. I can breathe into my throat and and put quite tremendous pressure in here and push things around. But they would do it with um, you know metal blades and things like this. You know. And you also you also a, a trained uh, molecular biologist, so you have a scientific background as well in in all of this. Study. Yes, yes. Molecular biology was my, was my first. Post, yes, it was my first postgraduate degree. Uh, so I, I did research in molecular biology, and and uh, and then after that, uh, another ten years after that, I did physiotherapy as a degree as well. So all of my degrees were in some sort of biology, essentially human biology, and uh, my most recent was a degree in exercise based physiotherapy, which I've been doing for the last twenty five, thirty years now. So I actually got to work in terms of breathing. I got. I got to work for a little while in a respiratory unit in a hospital, and that was actually very useful as well in terms of breathing and what I was doing with breathing. So as a physiotherapist, I was working in a hospital breathing unit. So your primary inspiration of breath just seemed to happen from the swimming. Um, and has that always yes. been the main focus yeah. for you? Was the, was the breath what got you into yoga? And, um, and what was it about the breathing? I was talking to a friend actually the other day on, on you know, who's got into free diving and just the interest in holding one's breath. What is it about the breath and even breath retention that is so fascinating for us? I think there was one expression that really took me one time, and that was that when you stop breathing, time seems to stop somehow. And when you hold your breath in, somehow you're in a timeless place where you become one with the universe when you hold your breath in. When you hold your breath out, you become so insignificantly small, you disappear into the universe. When you hold your breath in, you somehow become connected with the whole universe. That was an experience I felt. And that was something I always felt uh, from when I was doing the early free diving from the very, very beginning. It, it really gave me a very special connection to universal consciousness uh, in a way that, I mean, those simple words don't really reflect it perhaps, but that was something which always 
drew my attraction to it. Also, that feeling that holding the breath, you're at that point between life and death. And it really, I think it's something, there's something to be said for entering a place uh, physiologically and mentally where although we want to as much as possible stay relaxed and stay in a predominantly parasympathetic mode, which is going to encourage immunity and internal health, every once in a while to enter a state of sympathetic dominance where sympathetic nervous system is more that state of flight or fight. If you enter that every once in a while, what it does is it makes you appreciate that you're alive. So some people do it by uh, hang gliding or by free diving or by doing these really extreme sports. Because with, with extreme sports, there's that thing, any moment you could die. And But it's a bit dangerous doing extreme, extreme sports because it, it's, it's true that people do die. But when you're doing breath retentions, when you're holding your breath, you get that moment of like, my God, I could die. A second longer, I could die. And that really is a nice feeling because it makes you remember how good it is to be alive. Not too much of it, just a little bit every day to go, I'm lucky to be alive. And death could happen at an instant if I just stop breathing completely. So let's backtrack a minute and look at your philosophy of breath, because reading this morning again through some, some things you wrote, it strikes me as interesting that you always emphasize quite a natural sense of breath. You're not someone kind of emphasizing a, a very specific technique in the breath, more it's like a technique of almost no technique, allowing your body to breathe naturally is something that really comes through as the quality that I feel underpins your teaching, you know, um, which is, yeah, let me, yes. let me not, yeah, let me defer to you here. <laughs> okay, so what I tend to encourage my beginners is restore natural breathing at all times in your daily life. But at the same time, I try and encourage people must get off their bums, get off their seats and move. As a physiotherapist, my most favorite, favorite axiom is exercise is optional, but movement is essential. And so what I want people to do really as a general population type of person is to move more, but breathe more naturally while they move. And those two things together are very good. Someone who just breathes naturally while they're sitting slumped at a desk will not get many health benefits. They're certainly going to be better off sitting and breathing naturally at a desk uh, as compared to sitting at a desk and going and just over breathing deeply into their chest. It's certainly better to breathe naturally when you're sleeping or sitting. But if you can learn to restore natural breathing while you're exercising, while you're running, while you're doing weight training, while you're doing yoga, that's going to be much better than what most people do with, they do with their breathing. But having said that, once someone has mastered breathing during their activities, then before I'll change their natural breathing, this is mastering natural breathing. Once they've mastered natural breathing in the activities that they're doing, I would like to then re-educate the way they're moving and get them to not just breathe naturally, which is what I'll call breathing from their core, using their diaphragm and their pelvic floor properly, but then I'll also get them to move from their pore, from their core. And if they can move from their core and breathe from their core, then their natural breathing almost automatically becomes a very, very uh, advanced pranayama in some way. And maybe I can explain this a, a bit more as we go along. But so that's the step I take them through. I take them first, restore natural breathing, move more, and then start to move more naturally from their core, which is what natural movement involves. Once they've learned those things, then I'll start to encourage some of the special features that you can do with breathing, which we might call beyond natural breathing, which then start to approach supernatural breathing. Things like lengthening different parts of the breath, breathing into different parts of the body, uh, holding the breath and, and using pretend breathe in, pretend breathe out, creating Valsalva maneuvers and Mueller maneuvers, according to technical jargon. Bunda, according to yoga. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How do we? How does one start though? To, I mean, the natural breathing is diaphragmatic breathing, so you're contacting the diaphragm, right? You're using the diaphragm to breathe. So it's actually, I mean, it is potentially natural, but our natural breathing, as it as it stands these days, is pretty unnatural. The diaphragm is often frozen. The breath is often very shallow. Uh, it doesn't 
reach down further than the very top lobes of the lungs, the throat. How does one start to get the feeling of this diaphragm? You know, how, how do you start to restore natural breathing? This is the million dollar question, I think. Yes. Well, I think one of the key things that people um, need to appreciate is that the diaphragm is often restricted in the average population for, for two reasons. One is people are locking their core using muscles which actually are antagonistic to the di diaphragm. So when I say antagonistic, just for people who are not familiar with the terms, when you say do a chin up, when you bend your elbows to pull up your body and use your biceps, then the opposite muscles to the biceps, the muscles that bend your elbow will switch off. So when you're doing a push up, you use triceps with triceps. When you're doing a chin up, you use biceps. So the body's natural nervous system, uh, spinal reflex, network will work in such a way that when the bicep switches on, the tricep switches off. So when you use your muscles to do a chin up, the muscles for doing a push up will turn off and vice versa. Well, every muscle group has an antagonist or opposing muscle group. And the muscle group that inhibits the diaphragm which is the muscle of breathing into the abdomen, are muscles which we could loosely call the muscles of forced abdominal exhalation. Now, the muscles of forced abdominal exhalation specifically will be things called the internal and external oblique abdominal muscles. And when people use those muscles to engage their core, to tighten their abs, to exhale fully, to lock their core, those muscles will cause an inhibition or switching off of the diaphragm. And in my estimate as a physiotherapist, at least two-thirds to three-quarters of the average population, if you tell them to draw the navel to the spine or to engage their core or to exhale fully, they'll be mostly engaging muscles which will specifically inhibit their diaphragm. And that's one of the main reasons. And of course, that's a very popular thing to do if you're a girl, for example, who just wants to look good. They don't want to have a hanging out belly. They'll pull their abdomen in. Most people automatically inhibit the diaphragm to do this. Um, the other reason, and I'll talk maybe a bit later about how you can draw your navel to the spine. Uh, by, there's a way of drawing the navel to the spine by not doing this. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I suppose qualifying this and how, what is your feeling of the core then? Because most people would think the core is about squeezing the abs having, you know, a strong contraction there. So you're, I, I have seen your movement and you're, you remain soft in the middle. There's a softness in that core. But uh, so I, I can. maybe it's a re yes. it's also re redefining it as well. Perhaps the way that people refer or think, think about core. Yes. The core essentially is an invisible tiny spot, which is directly between, say, your pubic bone and your navel, the tailbone and the L5S1, between the pelvic floor and the diaphragm. And that invisible spot is surrounded by a network of nerves, which we call the enteric nervous system, which is the third and largest part of the autonomic or automatic nervous system. It's you know like the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, but actually a bigger uh, part of the nervous system, of the automatic or autonomic nervous system. That's actually the controlling nervous system for the body. In some cultures, they call it the second brain or the action brain. In Chinese uh, medical sciences and in Chinese martial arts, they call it the Dantian. In the, in the culture of Japan, they call it the Tanden, which is the center of the Hara. In Korea, they call it Dandon. In indigenous Australian cultures, some of them, they call it the Nadu Kuru. In India, the word they use for it is called the Kanda. And so, you know, Kandasana is a, fifth, a fourth or fifth series, depending on which way you use it, Ashtanga Vinyasa practice, where you bring the soles of the feet together on the chest as a, a much more advanced version of Bhadakonasana. So Kandasana is something which is, is this you know, representation of moving from the core. And the Kanda really is, according to when you read about it in the yoga text, is the origin of 72,000 nadis or subtle channels. And really that's talking about 
what in the West we call the enteric nervous system. So the enteric nervous system wraps around the intestines. And so also wrapping around the intestines, which is our digestive system, is most of our immune system. 80% of our immune system is there. Most of our intestines wrap around the core. And also most of our reproductive system is in that very same region. So the core really is at the essence of our body. Now around the core, there are some key muscles. And everyone knows about your abdominal muscles, but you know, including rectus abdominis, external, internal, external oblique, and maybe transverse abdominis. They also know about things like the back muscles, like the erector spinae and, and the multifidus. But what many people forget is that two other very important core muscles are the diaphragm itself, which is like the top of the core, and the pelvic floor, of course. And then on top of that, there is the psoas muscle. And so the other aspect that I was about to tell you that um, when I said that many people make two big mistakes, one is they lock the core by drawing the navel to the spine inappropriately. There's a good way of doing it and a bad way. Most people do it the way that inhibits the diaphragm. The other thing that inhibits the diaphragm is an over tense psoas muscle. So the psoas muscle is a muscle that comes from the inside of your thigh bone, the, the femur, and it goes over the front of your pelvis and it joins onto your L5-S1 region and it goes all the way up and joins onto the base of your diaphragm. So when your psoas is excessively tight, it actually pulls your diaphragm downwards into the position where the diaphragm is basically inhaled. So if your diaphragm is always in the descended position or the inhaled position when your psoas is pulling on it, it means your diaphragm won't work because it has to exhale before it inhales. Now, that means then that when a person is seated and their hips are flexed, they'll be able to breathe diaphragmatically. But as soon as they stand up, most people... The, the psoas muscle will, will tighten. It will do two things. It will pull the diaphragm down and prevent it from inhaling. And it will also put the lower back into a lordosis at L5S1 and impinge the lower back and cause many people, nine out of 10, the essence of lower back pain. But but for almost everyone, the back of the core is compressed because the core essentially, uh, its back entrance will be the L5S1 junction, which is almost in but that's below the level of the top of the hips. That's for most people compressed. So the psoas then is responsible for inhibiting the diaphragm because of its state of tension and also compressing the back of the core, which is your main energy center in the body. And it's where the breath should start from. They're the two worst things about inhibiting natural breathing. Sounds really interesting. And the idea that you could be sitting down and have, um, you know, the ability to connect to the diaphragm, the standing up not. I never, never realized that. And we had a guest recently called Liz Cook, uh, Liz Cook on the podcast, who is she's quite famous for her work on the on the psoas. Uh, would you say that the psoas then is the gateway to the, the, the diaphragm, to breathing or the other way around? Because I know that your, your movement is often very, um, let's say, kind of... Um, cyclical you do a lot of spiraling in the, in the way that you move is that for the breath sake or does that come from the breath yes yes it because it, it, well it depends who i'm talking to what i want is to make people move in a way that they connect with their core but once they've learned how to connect with their core i make all their movements start from their core but they have to first see the relationship so i have a, a sequence where first for example i'll get them to roll their shoulders and when they roll their shoulders and then stop in the different positions, if someone pushes their shoulder blades forward, you notice the spine bends forward. And if you push your shoulder blades backwards, it makes the spine bend backwards if you relax. So the first thing I do is say, move your shoulders. Then I say, now relax and see what happens. Well, it makes your spine bend forward. Then I say, well, natural movement actually should have happened first from the spine. So see the effect of bend the spine forward first, then move your shoulders forward. Shoulders work better. Move your spine backwards first, then move your spine, your shoulders backwards. Spine, the, the, the shoulders and the spine work better. And so then, once you understand that the spine should move before the shoulders, then you say, what should move before the spine? And so the spine is not our core; it's the back part of our core. The core involves also the trunk, and 
what we want is not just the trunk to move forward and backward, but we want the lower abdomen should move in before the spine bends forward. The lower abdomen should move out before the spine bends backward. And if you don't do this, if say, for example, you try doing a backward drop over from standing when you're moving to Urdhva Dhanurasana, if I can talk in yogic terms, the backward bend should include making the spine bend backward before you drop back, but it should include the abdomen expanding outwards first. So if anyone would like to try dropping back, I'd suggest first expand the abdomen, then start leaning back to drop back. And when you expand the abdomen as you lean back, your rectus abdominis will become active. So your core will automatically firm as you go back but you'll be able to breathe in if you don't think tight in your abdomen. Yet the abdomen is firm to touch, yet you'll be able to breathe into it. Hence, you have what we could call in the Ashtanga Sutras, stira sukham asanam, firm but calm. Okay, And then when you lean back, what happens is the abdomen is pushed outwards and you lean back. But if you do the opposite, if you begin a drop back by pulling your navel in toward the spine, then trying to drop back, you will be unable to breathe diaphragmatically and the back arch will hurt. So people could try that. They could start by standing up, relaxing and expanding the abdomen, leaning back and breathing naturally and it'll feel fine. And then compare, pull the abdomen in using the muscles of forced abdominal exhalation, then try and lean back and they'll notice the back hurts and it doesn't feel comfortable or relaxed. The core should move before the spine. Where, where are they gripping? Because, I mean, otherwise, the instruction could easily tend people to just stick the stomach out. But you're gripping somewhere in the stomach, so where is the feeling of engagement? What muscles are engaging there? Well, as you drop backwards, if you're just standing and you lean backwards, automatically a natural person like a baby or an adult who just relaxes will automatically engage the rectus abdominis. And the rectus abdominis is this... Um, it's essentially the muscle that you will project outwards when you do nauli, having first exhaled fully, held the breath out and expanded the chest to create the expansive Uddiyana Bandha, and then projected this nauli front. That nauli is exactly what would ha happen if you lean back from standing. I mean, I, I could show you this right now that's of value to you, but of course, people who are uh, seeing this wouldn't see it, who are only listening wouldn't see. Yeah. No, we can't. We should, can't should I show you all, all those? No, we can't exclude all those listeners. Describe it with your powers. Will you kind of have okay, to another it? time? I mean, you, you could. Yeah, another time. Another time. When it's you could you lean have, back. You, you have to. Them. Yeah, you have to come and do some some um, some of Simon's courses so you can see him see him do it in person. Um, and and if you haven't checked out the movements, yeah, watch watch the yeah watch the movements that he's doing. Um, right. So how to start then with a breath practice? just to go back into breath specific. And what's the difference between breath? People get very confused between breath work and pranayama, right? What's the difference between breath work and pranayama? And, and where to start for people that's sensible? Because people often like to get involved in heavy retentions and, uh, you know, then they're going to go crazy and, and then think, well, pranayama is dangerous or it's not for me. You know, like, yeah. What do you think? Okay, so in the beginning, as I mentioned to you before, the most important thing is to check that they can do natural breathing. So to revise that, natural breathing has got five key features. Number one is that the inhalation should feel like it is low, coming into the pelvic floor, the lower abdomen, or the lower back. Feel that the inhalation starts there. The second thing about natural breathing is that the exhalation should be passive and should not involve any extra tension to the body, any extra additional activation of muscles to what you had before. And it shouldn't involve noise or tension or anything like that. Third thing is that natural breathing is the minimal breath you could do at the time without spray, strain. It's minimal breathing. Fourth thing about natural breathing is that you could forget about it and it happens by itself. Like when you're asleep, in your most regenerative cycle, sleep. The fifth thing about natural breathing is that it's through the nose. Hence, for those who can't see me, I'm wearing a Ganesh t-shirt. Lord of the big noses. <laughs> I'm fine. Really, this guy. He should have spe been. Specifically for that, I didn't realize that you go, you'd done that with the big nose. Very good. <laughs> Actually, it only occurred to me just then. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's it. 
Interesting, though, that the idea of minimal breathing, because when you tell people, well, one tells people to breathe, usually the, the effort comes, right? And the effort kind of obscures that naturalness. So as a kind of key aspect, I think, to, to the way that you you talk about it is that it's a very uh, economic sense of breath rather than this forced, you know, especially in uh, Ashtanga for many years, there was this talk of Ujjayi, which is a very laboured, um, you know, um, very constricted, really. Uh, and, and and heavy kind of breath. So um, so you. I mean, I what, think it's, what, I think the F, the emphasis on that is less than that, hasn't it? It has. Yeah, I think it has. I mean, it was encouraged actually to you know for Ashtanga uh, politic discussion. It was encouraged in the early days by Patabi Joyce. Wanted more yes, sound. I remember wanted heavier breathing. Yeah, yeah, you were there. Yeah, um, but, I remember. Yeah, latterly, I mean, uh, it's, yeah, now it's. Um, the instruction is free breathing uh, with some sound, uh, but yeah, the uh, the sound shouldn't be too. Still, great. I think I think many people overdo it. Still, it's still some old some old teachers still like to encourage a great sound, like a big breath. Some of the old teachers encourage this. Uh, what's your feeling on that? Actually, just as a kind of sidebar. Look, there's no wrong or right, but at one point you also mentioned earlier on what's the difference between pranayama and breath work. And the modern understanding of breath work, when you when you see a lot of the uh, workshops when they talk about breath work, usually involve hyperventilation, and hyperventilation means breathing more in uh, than you actually need to breathe for the activity that you're doing. Hyperventilation means more breath per minute, more minute ventilation than you would actually need if you were just breathing naturally at that time, and so. Uh, that's uh, this hyperventilation has got significant effects on the body. Some of which uh, some people might consider positive, and but but eventually some of them could be very very negative. And so some of the positive effects that some people consider uh, make breath work, which is hyperventilation work what worthwhile, is that if you breathe more than normal, more more breath per minute, which could be the number of uh, breaths per minute times the volume of air per breath, that's called minute ventilation, then that will increase temporarily your flexibility because it causes your joint fluid, your muscle fluid and your nerve fluid, the fluid that lines the muscles and nerves and the joints, to become more thin. It becomes more runny. The thing about breath work then is it mostly is hyperventilation, and hyperventilation can have these positive effects in some people's eyes. One is that will increase flexibility, and hence someone doing, say, Ashtanga yoga, if they hyperventilate and make this, this sort of uh, loud breath and this forced breath, it will give them the benefits of increasing temporarily the flexibility. But and that can be joint flexibility or muscle or nerve flexibility. And another benefit will be that when they can hear their breath, they've got something to focus on. And that's some, what some people say. Another breath, another uh, benefit is that it will increase nerve sensitivity. And so many of the breath workers in the world today do something akin to what in the 1970s was often called rebirthing. And the idea of rebirthing is that you sensitize your nervous system with the breath so that you can remember your earliest memories and your nervous system becomes very, very sensitive. This can, however, put some people into a state of tetanus. This can shut your whole nervous system down. At the very minimal state, it can give people like a light woo, happiness, but that can become very quickly emotional catharsis, which can become actual trauma after a while for some people. So it's not something you can just do haphazardly. You know, you have to be very, very careful. The other benefit of hyperventilation is that because you are blowing off so much carbon dioxide, you then do not have inside you the chemical messenger which says you need to breathe. So if you hyperventilate first and you follow it with a breath retention, you can hold your breath a lot easier for a lot longer. And that's part of the reason why people like Wim Hof will hyperventilate first and then do a breath retention afterwards. But it doesn't actually allow you to hold your breath any longer. It just turns off what's essentially a safety switch inside your body. Because if you or I or anyone listening were to try and hold their breath right now without any warning, just stop breathing like that, 
what will happen is after a very short time, carbon dioxide builds up inside our bodies. And when carbon dioxide reaches a certain level inside our body, after, say, a minute, you'll get an urge to breathe. But that urge to breathe doesn't mean you're going to suffocate. It means warning, warning, better breathe soon because you're going to die in about five minutes. That's what it means. But we take it to be better breathe or I'm going to die. But really, you're not going to die for five minutes. But what the hyperventilation does, when you hyperventilate, you blow off that carbon dioxide. So as soon as you hold your breath after hyperventilation, you will initially feel this dizziness, queasiness, for reasons which I'll emphasize in a moment. But you'll feel these sensations, such as nerve sensitivity, lack of blood to the brain, and uh, a bunch of other things. But they will go away after a while. And then because you've got no carbon dioxide, You'll be holding your breath for what seems like many, many times longer, and you won't have the urge to breathe because the only thing you'll be sensing in terms of your urge to breathe is the level of carbon dioxide. Our body can't sense the levels of oxygen inside our body easily. It can only sense carbon dioxide. So if carbon dioxide levels take a long time to build up, again, if you've hyperventilated, because you blew it all off. So then it might be two or three or four or five minutes before you get the urge to breathe. But if you ignore the urge to breathe at that time, maybe if you take it a little bit too long, you can faint and you can just pass out instantly without any warning at all. You'll be feeling absolutely fine and you can pass out. Hence, intelligently, people like Wim Hof will always say things like, you must never do this technique while driving, while standing up whilst underwater. Because if you do, and you think you're holding your breath and you feel fine, suddenly you're gone. And one of the very first things my father taught me when I was swimming underwater was he said, you never do deep breathing or excessive breathing before you go underwater. A couple of natural breaths, there may be one breath in, one breath out, one breath in, hold. But never do. <laughs> Otherwise, you can risk death. You know, so in terms of what people are doing in yoga in that case, yeah. it's a very yeah, important yeah, yeah. thing to yeah, know. Yeah, 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 the reason yeah. why some teachers will actually still do it in their asana practice is because if you do this in an asana practice, it hypersensitizes the nervous system and it makes it very easy then that when you finish your asana practice and you can sit in a meditative practice, the body automatically knows not to breathe. So you very quickly enter a very deep state of meditation. And meditation is the place where in yoga they call it kevala kumbhaka, where kumbhaka is a breath retention, but the kevala kumbhaka is the one where you don't even realize you're not breathing. And so Anyone who's done meditation knows that the deepest parts of their meditation come when they realize, gee, I haven't been breathing at all for minutes, it seems like. And that's the real meditation when you're not breathing at all. Hence, if you want to learn how to do pranayama, which is the preliminary stage for, for, for meditation, you want to learn how to breathe less, not more. Hmm. Yeah, that's contrary to, to the advice we usually receive what about in the asana practice how do you kind of leave how do you leave a breath to make a, one's always talking about kind of under you know you're hearing these uh, you know terminology thrown around how do you actually leave a, the breath to utilize the diaphragm to make the asanas feel lighter or you know more, more stable even is there any any tips you could give in that, well, in that capacity yes it, it's hard to give them exactly without physically showing of someone, course yeah, yeah but yeah. suffice to say that People misunderstand Mula Bandha and Uddiyana Bandha in the world of Ashtanga Yoga. Some of the practitioners that I know very well and love, you know, because I've been with them for 30 or 40 years, some of these people actually understand Mula Bandha and Uddiyana Bandha very naturally, but they don't have the anatomical understanding to explain it to their students. So they might be doing it well themselves but they're not transmitting the information clearly to all of their students. And certainly the general consensus around the world today, if I look on the internet, is that many people think that Mula Bandha has something to do with tightening the pelvic floor and that Uriyana Bandha has something to do with drawing the navel toward the spine. That's often what you hear. But actually, it's important to appreciate that a Bandha 
something anatomically to do with the co-activation or simultaneous activation or tensing of the muscles of the opposing sides of a joint complex. And Uriana Bandha specifically has to do with chest muscles. Mula Bandha has to do more with lower, uh, lower trunk muscles, abdominal muscles, and they will trickle into the pelvic floor. So in yoga texts such as Mula Bandha, the master key, they talk about Mula Bandha as being specifically to do with the perineum, but not the anus and not the um, urethra. So when you look at Mula Bandha, the master key, it says Mula Bandha is to do with the perineum, which is in between the anus and the urethra. And the anal muscle constriction is called Ashvini Mudra. The urethra muscle constriction is called Vajroli Mudra in men, Sahajroli Mudra in women, and they're meant to be kept separate. And the Ashvini Mudra, the expansion of the anal mouth, that is part of what we call Kriya. So when before you learn uh, Ashtanga Yoga, in terms of the way most people learn it, you must understand Hatha Yoga. And because the philosophy that people practice is Ashtanga Yoga, but actually the practical application that people do it in the sequences that are taught by Sharat and his grandfather were taught, that's actually Hatha Yoga. And Hatha Yoga is called Saptanga Yoga. It's a seven-stage sequence. The first stage of Hatha Yoga is called Kriya. Second stage is called Asana. Third stage is called Mudra. Fourth stage is Pranayama. Then we have Dharana Dhyana Samadhi. But Kriya is Shat Kriya, six Kriyas. And one of the most important ones is called Basti. And Basti essentially is the ability to expand the chest without breathing, to expand the abdomen without breathing, and to expand your anal mouth without breathing, or to maybe just do all three of them in a way that you can do them at the same time. And I challenge anyone who's listening right now to feel if they can see first, if you can first, I mean, anyone listening, try this. Maybe you and I could try this at the same time. Breathe to expand the chest. Breathe in and make the chest as big as it can be, which is what people are being asked to do in classes. Now, having done that, now, first of all, expand your abdomen and expand your anal mouth. So open the anal mouth the same way you would as if about to defecate. Then expand the abdomen like a bloated child's belly, which is a diaphragmatic dissension. Then having expanded the anal mouth and expanded the belly, now try and expand your chest at the same time without losing the expansion of the belly. And notice it's quite difficult. Yeah, I can't do that. And that is the essence of busting. Okay? <laughs> so now try and tighten, tighten your pelvic floor, tighten your anus, and draw your navel to the spine. And now with the anus tight and the navel drawn to the spine, now breathe into the chest. And notice it's instantly easy. Yeah. Instantly easy, isn't it? Okay. Yeah. Now, checking that first, now do what natural breathing is, the breathing that you do in your most regenerative cycle, which is sleep. Now, when you're sleeping, you don't consciously tighten the abdomen or the pelvic floor, do you? So mm. let's try that. Let's relax the pelvic floor. Let's relax the abdomen and breathe into the abdomen. And it's relaxing and nice like it is when you're in this regenerative sleep cycle. Okay. So now try tightening your pelvic floor. And if everyone tightens everything in the pelvic floor, including the anus, as if trying to stop deli belly or barley belly or a diarrhea attack, tighten your pelvic floor. Now, with the pelvic floor tight, try and breathe into your abdomen. And notice for most people, it doesn't feel as relaxing. Okay? It feels like the breath mm -hmm. goes higher up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, try to pull your navel to the spine. Pull your navel to the spine like exhaling. And with the navel drawn to the spine so it hardens and goes in, Try and breathe into your abdomen now. And for most people, they can't breathe into the abdomen when the muscles of forced abdominal exhalation have been activated. But when those muscles, the anal constrictor muscles and the abdominal exhalation muscles are active, it's very easy to breathe in the chest. But what we're saying, therefore, then, is that the only reason most people can breathe into the chest is by doing the very thing that actually causes stress and disallows right. the natural breathing of sleep. That's, that's incredible, but very complicated. And, and it just springs to mind that people often ask me, where should I feel the breathing? I've been told, especially it used to be a, a lot of times with, uh, with people that were trained in singing. I for some reason had a lot of opera teachers that I was teaching at one point. They were saying, well, I should breathe into my stomach. I've been told to breathe into my stomach, but you're telling me to breathe elsewhere. And then more, you know, recently we obviously have the, many of the students who will say, where should I feel this breathing? In my stomach or in my back or in my throat? 
how would you answer that? Right. Well, the thing is, the beginner needs to make sure they can breathe into their pelvic floor and their abdomen, which is the essence of the beginning of Basti, the Kriya. But as you get more advanced, then you learn to first fill up the pelvic floor, then the abdomen, then the chest. So I think of it a little bit like filling up a glass of water. If you want to do a full yogic breath, you have to fill up the bottom of the glass first, then the top of the glass. But what most people do when they're breathing in the chest is they're filling the top of their glass without filling the bottom first. And so what we want in terms of chakras is to fill your muladhara chakra, then fill your swadhisthana without losing the muladhara, then fill the manipura, the abdominal breath, without losing the muladhara and swadhisthana, then you breathe into anahata, then you expand the chest. And then once you've done that, you do what my teachers can do and what I can do to a certain extent is to breathe into the throat, the Vishuddhi chakra. Then do what only one teacher I've ever had can do, which is to breathe into their eyeball and actually generate pressure in the throat, in the eyeball. Because if, you all, if all you're doing is breathing in the chest by inhibiting your diaphragm, it just makes you weak. And I could give some thought, thought experiments on this as well, if you like. Some thought experiments. Well, because I'd, I'd love to show them in, uh, in practice, but uh, I could just say them for you now. So what I could suggest, for example, okay. is okay. Yeah. at yeah. the end of an Ashtanga practice, many people, are taught, uh, uh, you know, many people will practice Utpluti, or in Iyengar yoga, we call it Tolasana, which is sitting cross-legged or lotus, put the hands on the floor, lift the body off the ground. Now, that movement is very similar to the Trini movement, which is done between the vinyasas on the floor. So when you're doing, say, changing from one side of Janushya Sasana to the next side of Janushya Sasana, we do a half vinyasa, where you're supposed to lift up into the air, float back to a push-up, inhale to an up dog, exhale to a down dog, jump back through on an inhale. This is what we do, isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so each time your body lifts into the air, that's meant to be an inhalation, correct? Yes, correct. Yeah. Okay. I'm just confused so the counting. So where is that breath going to be? Is it... Yes. So that inhale. Yeah. Yeah. So you inhale, lift up in the air. Exhale, push up. Inhale, up dog. Exhale, down dog. Inhale, jump through. Many people hold their breath at that time, but you're not meant to hold the breath. You're meant to breathe in. Now, that breathe in as you lift up into the air is counterintuitive. It goes against nature. If you just ask a child to lift the, put, put their hands on the floor, lift their body off their floor, the volume of their body decreases because they have to compress their body to lift up. So theoretically, air should come out. But we're told in the Ashtanga Yoga system to inhale at that point. But where do you inhale? So I'll ask people to try it. I'll ask people to put their hands on their floor and to lift up in the air when they breathe in. Now, if you breathe into your abdomen, you have power. But if you breathe into your chest, you have no power. But when you breathe into the chest, if you breathe into the chest because you've inhibited the, the abdomen, you'll have no power. But if you breathe into the abdomen and the abdomen is not firm, if it doesn't contain a mula bandha, then you also have no power. So what you have to do is work out a way of activating your abdominal muscles using primarily your rectus abdominis and then breathe into the abdomen while the rectus abdominis alone is firm. So one way you can do it is if you do it just simply cross-legged in the beginning, put your hands on the floor, and then lift the pubic bone up, and you'll feel the rectus abdominis becomes engaged. Then firm. Then the abdomen is, is firm, but you can still breathe into it. Breathe into the abdomen and lift up off the ground. And then notice that gives you power. But now if you try the opposite way, Sit on the floor, and before lifting up, tighten your pelvic floor, constrict your anus, and exhale, pull the navel to the spine first. Then try and lift up while breathing in the chest. And when you do that, there's almost no strength in your arms. Right. So when you're talking about breathing into the abdomen, you're not actually talking about breathing into the abdomen because the lungs aren't there, but is the putting of the diaphragm down? No? You're, you're talking about putting the diaphragm down. So when we talk about prana, there's five different types of prana. One of them is called prana. 
Prana is five different types. The prana is essentially to do with many things, not just oxygen. Prana has also to do with carbon dioxide. Prana has also to do with pressure. And the pressure that you feel when you breathe into your abdomen is not air, it's air pressure. So when you inhale into your, uh, with your diaphragm, air pressure, intra-abdominal pressure increases below the diaphragm. And the thoracic pressure decreases, and that's what causes air to rush into your nose or your mouth. So you're right. It's not air that actually goes into your stomach when you breathe in, but it's an increased intra-abdominal pressure. The art of pranayama includes not just the art of learning how to breathe less, but also how to take the different pranas in terms of pressures into different parts of the body. So eventually you learn to bring pressure into your throat, pressure into your eyeball, pressure into your skull. And so one invitation I might offer you perhaps is to try and take two fingers. If you can see me, I'm not sure you can see me or you can feel me. Take two fingers and place them into the base of your throat and push the fingers yeah. into the base of your throat. Now, most people, if they do that, will feel very uncomfortable. So I'll ask you to tighten the muscles in your neck and then push two fingers into your throat. And then you realize there are no muscles in the base of your throat. But what I can do and what my teachers can do is you can breathe into the base of your throat. And when you breathe into the base of your throat, you can generate an intra, um, intra uh, abdominal, intra thoracic, intracranial pressure that manifests in the throat and can actually, I can use it to, like, for example, if you were to sit in a chair with wheels on it, you could put your fingers against my throat and I would be able to push your body weight around the room. My teachers can bend metal bars. They can bend spear tips on their throat. Now, I can do something similar, and probably you can, when you do the exercise Mayurasana. So Mayurasana, which in, I think, I mean, I practice Ekahasta Mayurasana, which I think they can't yeah, be yeah. having. I've seen, you, I've seen you doing that. Yeah, yeah. And so Ekahasta Mayurasan, you do with a very relaxed abdomen. It's a mistake to tighten the abdomen. Abdominal muscles must be very relaxed. I've seen in many anatomy of yoga textbooks where they say Mayurasan involves certain abdominal muscles, which is not true. Mayurasan is done with a totally relaxed abdomen. And so when you put, um, like, I don't even have to do it with my elbow. I can lie on a pole and I can lay, lay on a pole and some people even do it on a sword and you impale yourself on a pole and arch upwards and your abdomen is completely soft and what allows you to go deeper into the exercise is to just inhale diaphragmatically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when you inhale diaphragmatically, that will give you the power to lift up off the floor. It's the same when people doing Surya Namaskar. When you do Ekam, arms up, Dve, hands to the floor. Trini is when you're supposed to inhale and lift up the body into the air. And that's because the inhalation will increase the intra-abdominal pressure, which will become intra-thoracic pressure, which will actually increase the pressure into the arms and allow you to lift up. You talked about the wind zone. Let's backtrack a second. You talked about the wind. I mean, you've just said so many different interesting things and there's so much information we can try to compress into this short time we have with you um what what um what's your feeling about the five uh, pranas what are they used for uh you talked about uh, increasing the pressures with these pranas pressures in different types of body would you just talk a little bit more about that the pressures that you get, the different pranas in the body, will only be manifestable and usable in an intelligent way if the breath all originates from your diaphragm. So it's perfectly fine to breathe in the chest, provided you've breathed diaphragmatically first. And that's what they call a complete yogic breath. And then when you can breathe diaphragmatically, at the same time as everything else, you can take that breath into any part of your body. And those different parts of the body have names like Apana, Udana, Samana, Viana, these sort of prana. And one of the types of prana is actually called prana. That's the one in your lungs. And then you have the the power to do things. Well, you know, the one that comes into your skin, I think that's Samana, I think. That's the one that allows you to do things like handstands and stuff like this, when you oh, can right. bring pressure okay. into your arms and legs. Right, right. But, of course, this is only a very small part. Right. Go on. Why would you 
create different pressure in, in uh, with the winds in different parts of the body? What would be the function of that? Well, it can give you strength. Right. But also, by bringing different pressures into different parts of the body, it can also move blood. And so you can use these pressures of the breath to change blood flow inside the body. Because actually, when you're moving pressures through your cardiopulmonary system, you're not just moving uh, air pressure, you're moving blood pressure. So right. you can actually use breathing as a means of promoting circulation inside the mm, body. Mm. And one of the oldest adages of the yogi is that the yogi counts their life not by the number of breaths they take, but by the number of, but not by the number of uh, uh, years they live, yeah, but by the number the breaths. of breaths they take mm. yes, and by the number yes. of beats their heart makes. So what you want essentially is to breathe less and make your heart beat less, but still make blood flow to be pronouncedly enhanced. And that's what, that's what this type of breathing is for. That's always the take-home point that I get with you, is that most people are teaching more, you know, stronger breath, stronger posture, and you always teach it the other way around, more economical, slower, you know. And um, Like an efficient car, you use less yeah. petrol to drive further, it's considered a better car. Like an efficient athlete, the athlete who runs fast and hardly breathes at all is called fit. But someone who walks slowly or stands in a triangle position and breathes a lot, I'd call them unfit. Mm. What or else about... you're either unfit or doing something which just causes stress. <laughs> what about health generally then, um, in terms of breathing, if people are, I mean, you know, have you got any practical examples of how to use breath yeah, to sure, heal, sure. get health or mental, you know, mental and emotional as well as physical complaints that might be, that might, the breath might be quite a panacea for, you know? Yes. Okay. Well, a person in a hospital, if you measure the amount of breath a person does in hospitals, the sickest people are the ones who breathe the most. The healthiest people are the ones who breathe the less. A person who is primarily stressed will tend to breathe too much and they'll breathe predominantly in their chest. So someone who has a lot of stress, the best thing they can do is go back to breathing into their pelvic floor and their lower abdomen. And someone who's depressed is also better off generally breathing naturally, but they need to move their blood. So what you need to get, get them to do is to breathe more. There is some limited evidence that a person who is depressed, if they breathe more than normal, it can stimulate their nervous system and it can actually help them out of their depression. But there are very few people who are purely depressed. Most people have elements of depression and stress at the same time. So if you get the average person who's got some signs of depression to breathe more, that will elevate their anxiety. So if you want someone who's going to, if you want someone to recover who is sick, just with any general sickness, what you want is their immune system to work better. And the best way of making their immune system work better is by breathing diaphragmatically. Because once the diaphragm starts to work, then their immune system starts to work. You see, you're always hearing that the breathing is the link between conscious and unconscious, between body and mind. We hear this a lot, don't we? But it's not breathing that's the link between conscious and unconscious. It's actually the diaphragm. The diaphragm is a special part of the body that has the ability to breathe both consciously when we're choosing to do so in a yoga practice and also unconsciously when we're doing our most regenerative cycle, sleep. And so what's special then is that it's a bridge between conscious and unconscious. But there are 11 other places in the body which are also bridges between conscious and unconscious. And a real secret to health is to actually focus on the other 11 places. These are places which we know of in yoga, but people often don't understand why. For example, the eye's ability to blink and the eye's ability to roll up and down, left and right, like drishti offers. So one of the purposes of drishti is to actually move the eyes in places, like for example, the drishti where you gaze at your third eye center, that's what we do when we're asleep. So if you can do that in your practice, you can actually access something which is a bridge between conscious and unconscious in the same way that breathing does. 
And if someone focuses on all their bridges at the same time, what happens is they forget their breathing and their diaphragm resorts to its most natural mode and their nervous system enters a place of parasympathetic dominance where the immune system starts to work a lot better than most people's immune system ever works. What about anxiety? You mentioned anxiety. Any breaths or any tips for that? Well, the best thing for anxiety, as I mentioned before, is to breathe very low into your pelvic floor and to restore natural breathing, as I mentioned before. But one additional tip, other than just breathing naturally and for the reasons I mentioned before about reestablishing the contact with the core, is if you can learn to do a cyclical breath, a cyclical breath, you might say, which is something as simple as inhale for a count of six, exhale for a count of six. But these breathings of inhale six, exhale, how six will only be of benefit if it's not excessive breathing. If it's almost maybe that inhale six, exhale six won't be a full lung. It can't be any more than about one tenth of a full breath in. But do six seconds, one tenth of a breath in, six seconds, one tenth of a breath out. And the inhalation and exhalation must be as in natural breathing. And when you do that, the six seconds in and six seconds out will cause the heart to increase on the inhale and decrease on the exhale, which will start to radically increase heart rate variability. So when the heart increases on inhale and decreases on exhale, this is something which is considered to be very, very good for parasympathetic health and for the health of the nervous system in general and will promote things such as immunity, reproduction, and digestion. And one of the easiest ways to promote that is by telling them, by telling people not to breathe in for six seconds, breathe out for six seconds, but better still, bend their knees for six seconds, straighten their knees for six seconds, lift their shoulders up past their ears for six seconds, drop their shoulders for six seconds. And best still is to do both at the same time. Because as I mentioned at the start of this talk, if you extend and flex your hips by bending and straightening your knees, then that will cause the diaphragm to move up and down, which will make you breathe in and breathe out. And if you lift your shoulders up and down, shoulder elevation will make your chest expand. Shoulder depression makes your chest go down. So if you simultaneously extend your hips and lift the shoulders for six seconds and depress your shoulders and drop down your hips for six seconds, it will cause the natural person who's breathing naturally to inhale for six seconds and exhale for six seconds without causing the problems of hyperventilation. That's a simple way of tricking someone into doing complex pranayama. Mm. So essentially the movements should be facilitated by the breath or the other way around. People often say, where does the movement come from? Does the movement precipitate the breath or does the breath precipitate the movement? Well, it depends on who you're talking to. If I've got a beginner who doesn't understand their breath, what I'll get them to do is to restore natural breathing and then just get them to move in this very simple way of making them uh, descend, uh, sorry, flex and extend their hips while elevating and depressing their shoulders. And it can look like the beginning of a very baby salute to the sun. But what you don't want to do is what many people do is when they lift their arms up they don't let their shoulders lift up. You must let the shoulders come up past the ears. And this is what you saw in all the pictures of Iyengar, Patabi Joyce, Desika Char, Krishnamacharya. When they're doing, um, say, Ekam in a salute to the sun, their shoulders are past their ears. But many modern yoga teachers are teaching that when you take your arms up, pull the shoulders down. That will disable breathing. You hear this, don't you? Many people say, arms up, pull your shoulders down and back. But no, right. arms up, shoulders should lift as well. <laughs> and then when you, when you do these movements, it makes a That's big difference. Then movement naturally should follow breathing. But what many people do is they restrict their movement by locking their core, by overextending their hips, by overlocking their knees, you know, which actually, you know, when you pull up the kneecaps and you really tighten the kneecaps, it overtenses the psoas. Right. And that will pull on the diaphragm, and that will overtense the front of the hips, and that causes problems then. When you pull the shoulders down, it doesn't allow the chest to move. It's all a bit complex and all a bit <laughs> long. 
But uh, you know, this is stuff for beginners. But if you want to really, if if you want to take it, go on. So you you talk. Sorry, it's hard. We got we've got the overlap. No, 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 no. no. (laughs) I was just thinking that everything, every single movement in the body is then related to the diaphragm, then which is related to. Yes, it is, and it should always start from the diaphragm. Mm, mm. Yes. Yeah. So when you get very good at understanding how to move from the core and breathe from the core, then you can begin pranayama. And I love my pranayama. And I, I, you know, to my advanced students, I will teach them much more than just natural breathing. So some of my favorite breath uh, practices, for example, I will in the morning, I will inhale for one minute, exhale for one minute. And I'll do that for about six minutes, three breaths, six minutes. Or I will do breath retention. And when I do breath retention, I can do like, you know, inhale. If I'm doing, say, a couple of breaths, like a few breaths in a row, my regular practice might be inhale for 30 seconds, hold the breath for one minute, exhale for 30 seconds. These are simple pranayamas. Or more complex pranayamas will include using bandha. So the bandha might be compressive bandha. Because there's two types of bandhas. There's bandhas that expand a region. Bandha is a subset of a, of a mudra. You know, when you look in the Hatha Yoga text, it says there are 32 different types of mudras. These include Kachari mudra, Nabha mudra, Shakti Chalani mudra, and Mula bandha, Uriyana bandha, Jalandara bandha. So a bandha is a subset of a mudra. But the thing is, a bandha has always two different types. A bandha we call a lock. And a lock can have two states, locked or unlocked. So mula bandha can have two types. It can have the mula bandha, which restricts blood flow through the, um, the, the diaphragm and the core, and one which encourages blood flow. And then uddhyana bandha can be one which encourages blood flow into the chest and one which discourages it. And jalandhara bandha is the same. So the biggest misunderstanding is that most people practicing yoga in the world and fitness in the world today are using an ex- a compressive mula bandha when it should be an expansive one, and they're using an expansive uriyana bandha when it should be a compressive one. In other words, most people are practicing with the abdomen sucked in and their chest expanded, which just gives weakness and tension and stress, when they should be practicing with a firm expanded abdomen and a compressed chest. That will give strength and calmness. <laughs> Uh, it's been a wonderful um, chat with you again, Simon. And um, just to finish off then, I usually ask people silly questions, but I'll ask you this. Tell me your pr- uh, pranayama practice then in the mornings. What do, what do you do? Just out of pure curiosity for our listeners here. Well, some of those things I mentioned were including what I would do. But in, in terms of bandha, what I will do, for example, is uh, breathe in. And I might take, you know, half a minute to breathe in, and then I'll hold my breath for one minute. And while I'm holding my breath for one minute, I will pretend to breathe out. And I'll pretend to breathe out using a positive pressure mula bandha, which constricts my navel to the spine in a way that will inhibit the diaphragm, but I don't need my diaphragm then. And I'll also pretend to exhale from the chest. And what this does is it increases the intra-abdominal pressure, intra-thoracic pressure in a way which actually pumps greater amounts of oxygen and carbon dioxide into my cells, which have the same effect as what could be called autogenous hyperbaric oxygen therapy or intermittent hypoxic therapy, both of which have been shown to have tremendous powerful effects on the immune system and on healing. But at the same time, these um, effects are akin to what the same things will happen if you do a valsalva maneuver. So these are the same things that a, a weightlifter will do, and you see them on the Olympics, to pick up tremendously heavy weights. But of course, it's very dangerous if you don't know what you're doing. So weightlifters doing this type of Valsalva maneuver, which we can do in pranayama when you pretend to breathe out while holding your breath in, you can actually burst blood vessels in the brain if you're not careful. So this is a very advanced pranayama. And it's not something I recommend to beginners. But when you do it in a way where your body's prepared and your blood vessels have been toned over years of practice, you can inhale, hold the breath in, and pretend to breathe out. And this will increase blood pressure to tremendous levels. But this can be very, very good and promote strength and flexibility and fitness if you are ready for it. It can also kill you if you're not ready for it. That's why I don't teach pranayama to people unless they're ready for it. Mm. Hmm. 
Well, I suppose that wraps up our hour. Um, I think we could go on for many more hours with you. <laughs> we'll do another one soon on yes. uh, Mudras, and, Mudras and Bundas will be the next one, maybe. I would, but, um, I would, I would absolutely love to. It's always a pleasure to talk to you, you know. And so I, I, I would love to to teach pranayama to people. And in the beginning, if people want to just come and see me and learn basic pranayama, I can teach it. Absolutely. But pranayama, I also teach, provided they've done my basic stuff. And I also love to teach breathing and poses as well. And there's lots I have to say about that. So if anyone wants yes, to write yes, to me, uh, yep. you're welcome to write to me, Simon at simonborglivy.com or Simon at yogasynergy.com. And I've got lots more to share with you. And I can give you away. You know, you go to the websites there's lots to give away for free as well yeah there is there's, his website is a minefield of information and um currently he is also doing a workshop with us we're lucky to have him on keen and yoga in, in a couple of weeks from this podcast yes i'm really looking forward yes and we'll Absolutely. talk about breathing and the different things we can do and i'll give you some practical exercises and in that in that uh, uh class we can actually go through some of the exercises that i've just done with you or the ones that i've talked about theoretically and we can try them in practice and we can fi finish with a beginner to advanced level practice just not the valse something which is you know for everyone <laughs> i maybe will touch upon it a little bit but not the full on dangerous one but the, you know the basic starts of it i can at least show you it anyway yeah, I'm kind of curious about that. A bit like um, when you're when you're on the toilet and um, you're having trouble, or something like that. Yes, yeah. yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll leave it there. Yeah. Thanks, Simon, again for a wonderful chat. I, I, w one last thing is, I've seen from your practice that the type of bundas that you're creating in your practice are excellent, and so you're doing actually really good things in your practice from what I'm seeing. It's, um, oh, it's just sometimes it's hard to understand the anatomy of it. And so it took mm -hmm. me a long time to understand what I was doing on an anatomical term. And that's why I did 3,000 hours of anatomy at university to try and understand hmm. what my body was mm. actually doing in a natural way. And so it's interesting. You know, you're, what you're doing is fantastic. So well done. Keep up the great work. And what you're sharing is brilliant.